It is my honor to introduce you our first plenary speaker, Bill Ho of Intel Corporation. His talk is entitled, Moore's Law, A Path Forward. Given the current challenge we're facing in our industry, it is very timely and fitting to have Bill here today to share his vision on the future of our industry. Bill Ho is an executive vice president and a general manager of technology and the manufacturing group at Intel. He is responsible for technology development and the company's worldwide manufacturing operations. On the host direction, Intel has led industry in introducing revolutionary transistor technology, including string silicon, high-k metal gate, and the tri-k transistor. Bill received his bachelor degree from University of Illinois, master degree from Santa Clara University. Bill received the University of Illinois ECE Distinguished Alumni Award in 2007. He is the 2013 IEEE uh, Frederick Philipp Award for his leadership in logic technology development. Bill received the Semiconductor Industry Association 2015 Robert Noyce Award for his leadership and the contribution to semiconductor industry. Ho chairs the Governing Council Advisory Board to the Semiconductor Research Corporation. On a personal note, Bill has been my manager and a mentor throughout my career at Intel. It is truly special to have Bill here without today. Please join me to welcome Bill Ho. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. Um, thank you all for getting up so early to come and join us for this first session, um, especially those of you from different time zones where this is even earlier than it is for us on the West Coast. Um, I'd also like to thank Kevin for that very kind introduction and the committee for inviting me to come and speak to you this morning. Um, clearly, this, I'm speaking today as a technologist, but um, I'd like to potentially try to convince you that in reality, I'm a circuit designer. Um, those at Intel who have known me for a long time um, still consider me a circuit designer and not a technologist. Um, but in a, a little brief attempt to try to persuade you of that, uh, 30 years ago, this paper was presented here. A um, long time ago, a lot different kind of technology. But you'll notice the third name on the paper is my name. This is my one and only um, paper here at ISSCC. Uh, and so if you give me a little bit of, of uh, leeway today and consider me a circuit designer, at least for the day. All right, I am going to talk about Moore's Law, um, hopefully a little bit differently than we've done it in the past. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on the economics of Moore's Law. Uh, this is clearly a concern across the industry about whether, in fact, we can afford to continue. Um, obviously, I'll spend some time on scaling and I do want to take a different tact on performance. I think it's very appropriate when you consider the focus of this conference on the Internet of Things. I'm going to make the case that, um, that today, not the first time, but certainly a most important factor is the reduction of power as we look at advancing technology. Um, I'm going to spend some time looking at the various transitions that we've seen and the kinds of things that have driven major transitions in technology. Um, take a look at some of those as we go towards the future. And then I want to give you a challenge about um, the needs that we're going to have from the circuit and architectural community in terms of adapting to technology as it does change going forward. Before I start, though, just a few brief reminders of what life used to be. This is um, an Intel 4004. The last four stands for 4-bit. It's generally agreed to be the first microprocessor. Um, the interesting fact I wanted to point out here is it was made with just five masks. Uh, four of them are shown here. I'm not sure why we only show four, but, but there were only five masks to implement that. Today, even the most simple technologies are having mask counts well into the 50s. The level of complexity is quite astounding. If you look a little more at the details of that, here is that same part shown side by side with the most recent generation Intel Core iProcessor. 
Um, you can see a number of things. One, clearly, the die size has increased dramatically. Um, this is just an indication of the improvement that we've been able to make in making technologies yield well. Down below on the table, you see a few of the statistics. The area of the wafer over that time period has gone up by 36 times. One of those, that's part of the reason for the ability to increase die size is that you actually have more room on the wafer. If you were to measure the technology by the name of the node, um, we would have reduced the linear dimensions in these technologies by almost 700 times. On the performance point, the com computational power of these two devices has changed by 3,500 times. And the two that I think are most important, the cost per transistor of the transistors used in that original device compared to today's devices has gone down by almost 60,000 times. And finally, most importantly, especially for the topics for this conference today and our industry in general, is that the efficiency, the energy efficiency of the transistors there has gone down by 90,000. A little more visual way of looking at that, this is a picture of a contact from around 1978. Um, thanks to Mark Bohr for this picture. Um, inside of it, we used to show a single contact years ago and show the scaling in contacts. However, now a single contact would be about a pixel on this. And so instead, we're showing a block of 10 14 nanometer SRAM cells. To just give you a, just a brief idea of just how much this industry has changed over the last 40 to 50 years. Truly an amazing accomplishment for everyone here as well as our industry. Okay, so on to Moore's Law. The first point I want to leave you with is Moore's Law is about economics. At the bottom is a quote from Gordon's original paper, uh, reduced cost is one of the big attractions of integrated circuits. I would contend that if you do not reduce the cost of a transistor, you are no longer really maintaining Moore's law. It is this ability to reduce cost 60,000 times as shown as that previous foil. The ability to reduce cost is what allows us to innovate and add functionality and features to our devices. People are not willing or not able in many cases to pay for more expensive devices. And so if we're going to be able to continue to expand the scope of electronics, we need to be able to do this with reduced cost. However, it's not just about economics. While reducing cost per transistor is clearly one of the most important aspects, it is not the only aspect. We also have to deal with power. I would contend that power is equally as important to cost. Because while you may be able to afford to put more transistors in your device, if the power does not go down, likely the environment in which your product is going to be used will not tolerate an increase in power. Whether it's your phone or your watch you know, or, or a supercomputer in a building that's limited by air conditioning, power today is one of the primary focuses of our industry. So to really advance Moore's Law, you have to reduce cost and you have to reduce power. Now, unless I imply that Gordon did not see this as well, here's another quote from his original paper. The section is titled, The Heat Problem, and the statement is, will it be possible to remove the heat generated by the tens of thousands, notice we're talking tens of thousands of components, not transistors, but all components included, that will be in a single silicon chip? So we are left with two basic thoughts from Moore's Law. One, reducing cost is the fundamental metric, and power, even 50 years ago, was one of the most primary concerns. Now, when you're giving a plenary talk, your talk does not necessarily have to be well organized. So I'm going to take a little diversion and make a few comments on 3D. There are various forms of 3D. Here I'm going to illustrate three. Clearly, I would contend that the FinFET device is an example of applying 3D. So the device has been taken out of the surface of the wafer and now built above the wafer. An even more impressive example might be 3D NAND, where um, the industry has been able to stack multiple layers. We're going to see a paper later in this session on 48 layers being stacked. In both of these cases, we are clearly going into the third dimension. Another example is die stacking. And here's an example of stacking die using through silicon vias. All of these can be classified as 3D. However, I think it's very important that as we begin to apply 3D that we realize these two 
I would contend, enable Moore's law. They enable Moore's law because not only do they use three dimensions as a way of, of scaling, but they also reduce the cost of a transistor. In the case of the FinFET, the area consumed on the wafer and therefore the area consumed by a transistor has been dramatically reduced by building the transistor up at a cost of a few processing steps as opposed to spreading it out over the surface of the wafer. In the case of the 3D NAND, these are not 32 additional equally complex processing steps, but this is a very innovative way of combining steps and in fact implementing many of those steps at a much reduced cost. So in both of these, if you were to calculate the cost per transistor or the cost per bit, they actually do provide that critical cost reduction. Now in the case of 3D die stacking, this is a very innovative technology, equally as complex in some ways as the other two, but it does not in fact reduce cost, it in fact increases cost. Now it serves a very useful purpose in form factor and in many cases speed and bandwidth in the case of stacking memory, but it does not in fact reduce cost per transistor and I would suggest we have to be careful about the kinds of 3D and the kinds of uh, technologies that we can actually consider as advancing Moore's law. Again, fundamentally, you must reduce the cost per transistor if you're going to continue the tradition we have of being able to provide more complex and more innovative devices at the same cost. All right, so clearly if I'm going to talk about Moore's law, I have to talk about the end. I'm not going to predict the end, but I am going to point out Here's a paper from, here's a page from 2009 that Mark Bohr presented indicating the kinds of predictions that were being made about the end of Moore's law. Now, I don't want to deal with the details of each one of them, only two points. One, they're all technical limitations. There are some technical problem that somebody felt was going to be the ultimate end of Moore's law. Now we can look back and say that all of them were in fact false predictions because we've succeeded in surmounting all of those technical challenges. Today, however, what you'll notice is most of the statements around the end of Moore's law have to do with affordability. That's not to say there are not technical challenges, and I'm certain there are some of us here who could predict a number of fairly significant technical challenges for which we do not currently have a solution. But the challenge that seems to be most on our minds is the economics, and so I'm going to spend some time dealing with the economics of Moore's law as it looks today. So let me start and just remind us, fundamentally Moore's law is about reducing the size of the transistor. That enables you to either put the same number of functions, the same number of devices, the same capability into a much reduced area, or the more common approach is to put twice as much or a significantly enhanced capability into the same silicon area and therefore roughly the same cost. Now neither one of those two examples is probably the correct one, those of you in this room will make the right optimizations between reducing cost or increasing functionality, but Moore's law fundamentally enables innovation and cost reductions. Just one note, th there's no visible timer, so you guys are at the mercy of my memory uh, since I can't see how much time I've used. Ah, thank you, it's down here. I think I'll put that a little more obvious to me. So at Intel, um, I told you my circuit design story, my little secret. Um, let me tell you another secret about Intel. Intel is largely managed by finance. Okay? You might think of Intel as a technology company, but we have a very, very rigorous finance department, and they watch us all the time. And it's useful, because clearly, with economics becoming a more significant challenge, um, it's very important that we study not only the technical aspects, but also the economic aspects of our technology. And so over the years, we've put a lot of investment into modeling the economics of Moore's Law as well as the technical aspects. So I'm going to show you some results from this model that we've produced. Now, we've used this over a number of generations, and we update it as the trends change. We use it to predict what is, in fact, the economic benefit that a company the size of Intel would see. I'm using Intel as an example because obviously that's the data I have. But in general, most of the people who are continuing to advance silicon technology are equally large and have equal economics. So here's, an here's what it would cost Intel 
if we were to continue the roughly the same trend lines to manufacture our devices over the next 10 years. There's two aspects of that cost. In blue is the cost of the factories and the materials and the equipment necessary to build the increasing number of devices. In red is the part for the technology development, because obviously if you're going to advance technology, and in this particular example, we're assuming that technology continues to advance at the traditional rate, and that every so many, genera I mean, so many years, a new generation of technology is introduced that enables those transistors that you're going to build to be made more cost effectively. The red is the cost of that development. It's a big number, $116 billion over the next 10 years. However, it pales in comparison to what that cost would be if you were to attempt to build those same devices, or for the purpose of this, the same number of transistors using the technology that exists today. Now, that difference is the benefit of the cost benefit, not, not the fact that the products will be more effective, will be lower power and more attractive, but just simply the cost to manufacture them would provide almost a 3x benefit. Now, when you look at the size of the bars, that should give an indication that there's a lot of room for increased development cost, which is very important to my heart because I run the development organization and obviously would like to have more money. But let's take a little more detailed look at that. So here's a plot of the amount of money that would be spent on the R&D over that 10-year period. I've shown two lines here. The line in yellow is the amount, had we been able to maintain the roughly 10% increase per generation of development costs. And if you look back over the history of Moore's Law, what we've generally seen is that the cost of a new generation of technology had been on the order of 10% more. It was largely in the wafer cost, and when you're doing development, largely the cost of the wafer is what drives your cost. And while certainly there is cost of people, that's also generally proportional to the complexity of the wafer, and that 10% number had been very common for a very long period of time. In the last few generations, we've seen a dramatic increase in that, and we're now running at a rate closer to 30% per generation of increased spending in order to do the development of that new technology. What we're able to do with our model is to take a look and say, okay, so how much is the point at which those two bars on that previous graph would be equal and there would be no economic cost benefit? It would require an increase of 190% per generation or per, per generation of development costs. And if somehow anyone would allow you to spend that much, you would be spending or Intel would be spending approximately $80 billion per year just on the technology development. Now, that will never happen, I can assure you. Um, the finance people would never allow that. But what it does say is that this concern about the cost of the development of the technology is really something we're probably not going to have to worry about as long as the scale is of a reasonable size. So there's a lot of room in this area. A more significant concern, though, is the cost of the transistor. Remember, fundamentally, reducing the cost of the transistor is the key metric. So here's again a plot of the trend line for the reduction in cost per transistor. And while we talk about 2x reduction in area, in reality, when you look at the actual cost reduction trend, um, for this period back to 65 nanometers and even going back further, it's roughly been 30% cost reduction in the cost of a transistor per technology generation. It's been a very stable number for a very long period of time. As we become very focused on this in the last two generations, at Intel we've actually been able to beat this line somewhat. Okay, so these are the existing trends. And the idea is the same as the last time. If you look at how much would this degrade before you have wiped out the benefit, that, two, that $200 billion benefit in cost reduction, would only have to degrade to about 0.86 or a 14% cost reduction per generation. Now, you're still getting a 14% cost reduction. However, that is not sufficient in Intel's case to be able to offset the cost of developing the technology. So while in the case of development costs, we have lots of room. In the area of the cost per transistor, it is very important that we remain focused on the fact that the fundamental aspect that makes Moore's Law economically feasible as well as attractive is reducing the cost per transistor. Now, this is actually a fairly substantial difference. The difference between a more than 30% reduction and less than 15% is a very significant change. 
but it is not anywhere near the amount of margin for error that we had in the case of development costs. And you can look at many cases. We've looked at volume, we've looked at scale. Most all of the rest of them have substantial opportunity in the future. This is the one that we must be most concerned about. And again, very interestingly, it is the fundamental benefit that Gordon was pointing out 50 years ago. So the biggest driver there is wafer cost. So what is the opportunity to deal with that? Well, there's really three factors. There's two factors involved in defining the cost of a transistor. One, in the first chart I'll show you, the cost per millimeter squared of silicon, or basically that's the same shape graph as the cost of a wafer. The second is how much area it takes for each given transistor. That's basically the scaling benefit. And if you multiply those two together, you'll end up with the cost per transistor. So this is the trend for wafer cost. And what you'll notice is an accelerating increase in the cost of each wafer. This is the difference between the historical 10% and what now is running at closer to 30%. Clearly, if you have a 3x increase in this, you're going to have an impact on the cost per transistor. This is what we observed, and this is what I'm sure the rest of the industry has also observed. This is caused by a number of factors, certainly not alone, but certainly a significant one, is the lack of fundamental improvement in our lithography capability over the last 10 years. Clearly that has added a tr tremendous amount of complexity that translates directly into cost. So in order to deal with that, you have to make improvements in the scaling. If you want the basic product to be the same, the cost per transistor to continue to go down, you need to offset that increase in wafer cost with a higher degree of scaling. Now, I said the predominant cause of increased wafer cost is the lack of real fundamental improvement in patterning capability. And what has the industry adopted in order to address that? Multi-patterning. So effectively, the simplest way of looking at it is, instead of using one mask or one etch or one layer to define the pattern on the mask, you'll use two. That gives you a factor of two in scaling resolution. So how do you accomplish advanced or higher rates of density scaling? You recognize that if I'm going to have to take the cost of double patterning, I don't want to follow a traditional 0.7 linear scaling of other linear dimensions. I want to take advantage of almost all of it. And as much as possible, I want to make things half the linear size, which gives me an increased rate. Now, this is not across all layers. It has to be used selectively. But the silver lining of the dark cloud of lack of lithography improvement is, in fact, the ability to do faster than normal scaling and use that faster scaling to more than offset the increase in cost. And the end result, then, is a trend line in cost per transistor that is actually slightly exceeding the historical 30% per generation. Now, it's too early to really make a strong prediction about seven nanometers, but I think we're at the point in our seven nanometer development that we can say um, we will be in this range. I've shown here a, a range of both wafer cost, scaling, and effective cost per transistor. And while this range now begins to approach that historical line, we're still able to deliver a substantial cost reduction. And as the, as the details become clear over the next few years, we'll obviously end up at a single point on this chart. But for now, even looking out as far as seven nanometers, we see a real feasible path to continuing cost reduction. So I want to move on to technology transitions. Again, looking back at history, this, this plot is basically the node name or the linear dimension of scaling. Um, but the significant part is looking at the kinds of transitions we've seen in technology. In the early days, we saw a fairly rapid change in the kind of device. Now, I can remember the change from bipolar to CMOS and M to MOSFETs. That's a long time ago. Um, but then I've been around a long time, so it's not anything new. But the primary cause for that change from bipolar to what was PMOS at the time wasn't for performance, it was for power. It was impossible to envision continuing to scale either TTL or more prominently ECL circuits and continue to add more devices and be able to cool those parts. So the industry was driven to make a transition to what was a slower technology in order to address power right in the early days. 
if you look at the transition to CMOS, this was basically doubling the number of steps. Now in these days, we didn't have 11, 12 mask layers for metal, or not mask layers, but layers of metal. We had one. Most devices built in the time of the CMOS transition, certainly on that DRAM paper, had one metal layer, which means the predominant cost of your wafer was in building the transistors. Going from a single polarity device to a CMOS device was almost doubling the cost of the transistor. And again, the driver was power. So in one case, we were willing to sacrifice substantial amounts of performance to reduce power. In the second one, we were, able to, we were willing to add substantial amounts of cost, again, compensated for by scaling, in order to reduce power. So in the very early days, we saw a tremendous focus on dealing with power. Now, we had a golden age of CMOS, I think all of us would agree, where scaling was almost perfectly following Denard's rules, and we had basically good on all fronts. Now, more recently, as we've reached the end of that period, again, you see fairly substantial transitions. It's been written that the change to high-K metal gate was one of the most significant changes in our industry, changing from an oxide, perfect material to build devices, to other forms of insulator was a major change. What drove that? Happened to be leakage power at the time, but it was power. What drives the change to FinFETs? Happens to be source drain leakage, the ability to turn the device off, power. So my contention here, most major transitions in our industry are in fact driven by the need to address power. And I think that is exactly what we're going to see as we look at devices that are likely to populate our future. Now, you can even see this in the trend lines. This is a theoretical line for what one could have done for gate delay over the last four or five generations. And if we had taken that path for gate delay, we would have seen a reduction in switching energy. Clearly, scaling still improves switching power. And that would have resulted in an energy delay product of fairly substantial improvement. But in fact, that is not what we chose to do at Intel. We took a much less aggressive path on gate delay which enabled a much more significant reduction in switching energy. Now, interestingly, it produces about the exact same energy delay product. Two things I want to take away from this. One, it is becoming increasingly important that we focus on power as opposed to pure delay. And second, that energy delay is a fairly universal metric in looking at the improvements in technology. In this case, two fairly substantial different ways of implementing the devices generate a very similar energy delay product. So I want to use that metric as I look at future devices. In addition to addressing power, what we're also seeing is an increase in capability in the devices that we do build. Here are plots for 130 nanometer transistors. And what you see is about an order of magnitude difference in the levels of leakage current that one might be able to choose. And for that, a slight improvement in the performance that one would get from those devices. If you look at today's likely 10 nanometer devices, what you see is an almost three orders of magnitude range in leakage current and a much more substantial area that the design person can choose where is the right optimization point. All that is good. There's more capability, more options, more choices for the design. However, it comes at the cost of substantially increased complexity. Whereas in the first case at 130 nanometers, it took about two VTs or two different kinds of transistors per type. Today, to expand that range to that large area takes almost five different VTs, which also means five different devices to be optimized and dealt with within the design environment. So in addition to a focus on power, we're also having an explosion in the amount of complexity or the capability that is available as you go about optimizing your parts. This, in contrast to that one single PMOS device at the very beginning of the transition from bipolar. So let's talk a little bit about Beyond CMOS. There's a number of interesting devices, and I want to show some data on them to make a few points. Um, they're quite different. They have different conduction mechanisms. They have different computational mechanisms. Um, they're different. That's the one thing that I think is fair to say. Now, do they provide benefit? That's what I want to address. So let's go back to this measure of technology improvement. Here's a graph of energy versus delay. 
And on this graph, we can plot the history of recent CMOS technologies as measured by ITRS. And you see a nice steady progression and a movement down to the left on this chart. And this is not changing. This is, again, the prediction for the 2018 ITRS is a device that will be down and to the left of the previous devices. You see here the expanded range. That's very similar to what I showed you on those 10 nanometer devices. A large choice, but again, on fundamentally the same line for performance of the technology. Well, let's look at some of the next beyond CMOS devices. Well, first, first, let me just for reference on this chart indicate roughly two generations of technology improvements. So if you were to look at what we achieved by doing two generations of lithography scaling, technology scaling, it would have been historically about this much movement on this chart. So now let's look at some of the electronic or the, the TFET as one example of devices on this chart. And what you see is they, in fact, are capable of providing almost two generations of improvement. If you compare them to the energy delay line for the best CMOS devices, and you look at the same technology, there's reference data that says we could expect to see roughly two generations of improvement. The problem is, what is the improvement direction? It's all coming in reduced power. The devices are actually slower. Does this have a slight remembrance of history? Devices now becoming slower in order to address power. A tremendous improvement in the amount of power, the energy delay, or the energy portion of this, but no longer providing on this particular type of device an improvement in speed. If you look at some of the other devices, and some of these being non-volatile, which provided their own kind of benefit, we see even an increase of that same vector. Again, the best of these new devices are, in fact, capable of providing a substantial pure technology improvement but they come with a tremendous benefit in power and a reduced performance as measured by speed. And I just point out again, this is very reminiscent of that initial transition between bipolar and CMOS. And while today, thinking about bipolar silicon devices to MOS silicon devices may seem like a fairly trivial for one who lived through that transition, was a fairly significant change. Um, certainly, if you look at any circuits, they don't look even remotely similar. So, I'll make another point. I'll make, try to make this point again about the importance about um, design interacting and enabling technology. This is an example of some of the technology innovations that were necessary over the last 15 years in order continue to have CMOS technology appear to generally follow the traditional scaling benefit. Clearly, the end of scaling occurred, of pure scaling, and what was necessary now was a continual series of innovations that enabled the devices to improve. They changed. They changed substantially from the technology side. From the device side and from the circuit side, they appeared largely the same. But even over this period, we also required substantial design and architecture assist in order to make these devices actually useful. I would say that the change to dual and multi-core was driven because even with these improvements, power was a growing problem. Had we been able to reduce power sufficiently, we would have seen much more improvement in frequency and single-threaded performance, but instead we were really forced to move into the multi-core era. There's a tremendous focus on power regulation on all parts today, whether it's in terms of dynamic frequency scaling or on-chip regulation or just simple power gating. A large portion of the effort in designing parts today is in dealing with power. That's in spite of the amount of innovation we see on the technology side. And finally, another couple of examples. To make the SRAM even work today in an advanced technology requires a substantial amount of design assistance. The SRAM cell is no longer writable without, in, in a traditional sense, it requires additional circuitry to enable it to be put into correct state so that it's possible to write the cell and at the same time retain data. And in the case of the analog scaling, you know, technology has made a lot of improvement in analog, but much of the improvement has come 
by changing the designs and applying as much digital technology to those analog functions as possible in order to take advantage of the digital portion. So let me look at some of the implications of the Beyond CMOS devices. The first thing that I would say is they're different. They're different in almost every vein. They're different in materials, in the types of circuits that they require, probably even in the computer architecture that they will require. Now when something is different, it also has its own silver lining. Those different devices provide a wealth of opportunities for innovation and research. And over the next few years, tremendous progress is going to make in figuring out the right way to re-architect our parts, to take advantage of the amazing amount of power reduction that these new devices can provide, and compensating for the fact that they really are not fundamentally faster than the existing CMOS devices. And finally, I would say that where CMOS devices do have limitations, what we're going to see as we move into this new era is a mixed mode operation. These new devices will not replace CMOS, but they will augment it, likely built on the same wafer, likely giving you yet another choice, certainly a degree of complexity, but the ability to actually partition your part into those parts that still deserve to be implemented in CMOS and those parts that can materially take an advantage of these new devices on the same wafer in the same part, optimizing for the, for the different opportunities and benefits of these devices. So in summary, Moore's Law is fundamentally about cost per function. If you cannot reduce cost, then you really cannot really say that you're maintaining Moore's Law. However, in order to take use of those functions, power reduction is critical. And certainly as you look at the Internet of Things and the directions that our industry is moving power, is a critical factor. I'd like to have convinced you, possibly, that the economics of Moore's Law remain sound. There are certainly challenges, but if we focus on reducing the cost per transistor and optimizing our technology to deliver that cost reduction, the rest of the economics are fine. When I look at the future of technology, I think two things are clear. The focus is going to move from devices and technology that provide pure speed improvement to devices and technology that in fact enabled dramatic reductions in active power. And secondly, we are going to see change in the form of that technology. While CMOS will remain as the base building block, almost all new technologies will be fundamentally different in their form from CMOS. Now, this is an audience of circuit designers, right, and architects. You're at the heart of enabling this future. I could almost say that you have the most opportunity of all of us. These devices are going to exist. People are going to learn how to make them. It's going to be your challenge to figure out how to make innovations so that we can harvest the benefit of these truly exciting devices. So one last foil, and then I'm done, almost on time. When you look out at the future of the technology, and this I'm not intending to talk to all these, but what you see is a rich, variety of opportunity in the areas of research for new technologies. Now, I can't tell you which of those technologies are likely to be the first or the best, but what I can say is, in the past, when we've seen this kind of richness of ideas within the research community, we can almost be assured that out of this will come the devices that are necessary to enable that future. And as long as we can figure out the best way to use those devices, I am very confident that whoever is standing here 10 years from now talking about the future of Moore's Law will be giving you an equally rosy picture. Thank you very much.